There are good days and then there are bad days. Today was a bad day. One of the last things we had to do before our working season really started taking off is we went down the Salmon River to a place called the Salmon River Lodge to help a friend get things ready for winter down there. Uh, it's a very remote place and uh, we had to get all the water out of the pipes and just get ready for winter. Hey, is this Brooks? You ready, buddy? Let's get to work. Getting to the lodge is always an adventure. It's no easy feat to get there. It's uh, 50 miles of dirt road winding down the river of no return. Uh, you go right past the birthplace of Sacagawea. It's just a beautiful place. Go ahead. Doesn't matter. What's up, Brooks? What's up, guys? How's it going? Hey, how you doing? It's a freaking sap. Is it right here? Yeah, it was. Nice. The road's a little rough, but it shouldn't be many, many people on it. The lodge is nestled in to the Frank Church Wilderness, um, and it's just kind of sitting down there, right on the river, and it's a breathtaking place. It's it's genuinely a wild place. I have a very deep love for the salmon country, central Idaho. I love the Salmon River. I owned the Salmon River Lodge for 30 years. Uh, I love that country. And Salmon, Idaho is a population of what, four or 5,000 people? A uh, wonderful place. So it's kind of cool how everything's set up there. The water source comes right out of, right out of a creek. And it's kind of a long pipe that, that goes kind of up onto the mountain and it pulls the water out of this creek. Um, just one of those crystal clear, clean mountain streams. We went through all the different cabins, through the lodge, um, you know, made sure everything was everything was drained, everything had, you know, the antifreeze in it that needed to have in it. So before I was a firefighter, I worked as a plumber, um, working for a guy local. So I have the background in plumbing, and when Brock and Brigham told me that they needed to go up to the lodge to kind of relearn how to winterize the place and just shut down the plumbing and, and make sure that nothing was going to stay on. Um, they called me up and they said, hey, we're going to go up there this day and we're going to do this. We're not plumbers and we're not experts. It'd be nice if we had somebody there that who knew that what they were talking about when it comes to plumbing. Any excuse for me is a good enough one. And I said, it's middle of hunting season. So I said, all right, but I'm bringing my rifle in case we see a deer or a bear. And there's like, oh, we wouldn't expect anything less. You know, like I said, that's that's kind of the name of the game. That's yeah, very strange to come back to a place like this after you've been gone for, I don't know, 10 years or so, seven years, something like that. Mm -hmm. So my, my earliest memory ever is actually here, walking down one of those, one of those uh, trails with my parents. That's the first, first memory that I ever can recall as a kid was, was up here with my family, we used to go up here. Uh, we came up here all the time with family friends and our families and just tube around, ride horses and hunt, fish, do all, I, do all that kind of stuff. Is This is where I learned to, to do all that stuff. It's up here. Just leave it, take it out, have to make your repair job. That's Brooks, what the major repairs are. 
One of the things we did while we were down there to help, to help our friend is they were pulling out all of the saddles after a, a long season of use. And uh, we loaded them onto a trailer and brought them back to town to, to a saddle shop and let them kind of clean all the saddles up and replace rivets and do stirrups or anything that needed, needed repairs. So this saddle was mine. I had it made for Whitey. I'm leaving it here, but I took one of these smaller, I took a saddle kind of like this one. I just swapped it. I don't care what you do or how we do it, but we got, we can make a couple of loads if we need to. Yeah, maybe let's make a couple of loads. Let's uh, I'll stand up. You want to start stacking it? So once we got all with all that done, we went and um, pulled the boat out and started hauling hauling the boat out. Tyler is in the back seat and he's just chatting the whole time, saying how funny it would be if if we did a bet and the loser has to ride in the jet boat down the river road. I was sitting there thinking, I was like, actually, that sounds kind of fun, anyways. Like I wouldn't necessarily have to lose a bet to go do that. So uh, we pulled over and. I jumped out and went and jumped in the boat. It kind of went from being a punishment to something that I really wanted to do. I keep looking in the back window and I just see him captain this boat like he's on the on the ocean. Like, I gotta get back there with him. They stopped the truck. So they stopped the truck and I crawled back there with them and we were riding on that boat and shouting at fishermen and people were giving us a thumbs up and just dying alone. Standard stuff for our operation. Yeah. So I kept like, I kept started telling Brock to pull over. Of course he wouldn't, he just kept going. So I had to ride it out till we got to the end of the road. Man, I am not stopping till I get these boys to see him. I think they both have their shirts off now. I think they do. Yeah, they're both topless in the boat behind me on a trailer as we're driving down the road. <laughs> So we made it back to the ranch. We, you know, parked the boat and, you know, realized we had a few, a few extra minutes. So we decided to go look for a white-tailed deer. Tyler had a deer tag. Me and Brock both had tags in different units. So uh, we weren't hunting up there, but Tyler had a tag in his pocket and had his rifle. So we, you know, we have kind of a honey hole that we know that deer like to hang out. So we cruised over there and sat there for a few minutes and just waited kind of as, you know, as evening came in and. Sure enough, you know, the deer started to kind of feeding up and we got back to the ranch. It was the evening time and we spotted a decent, decent white-tailed deer for, for our area. I think those white are moving pretty quick. That way, as much as I'd like to think they came this way, just with the contours and the way that they were moving, it leads me to believe they were headed like just, just straight due east. watched him and um, thought we were gonna make a kind of make a play on him and he eluded us right he was never turned him up which that's that's how it goes sometimes you just think you're gonna have something and, and it doesn't work out the next day we're coming back to to load all of our all of our bags and stuff up in the truck and we see these deer and so Brigham and Tyler went down to to see if they could find this deer so we get out there and Sure enough, we get set up at the corner of this fence post and Brigham, he's looking through his binos and he says, hey, I see him coming. I see some does walking over here and they start hopping the fence and feeding down into this little coulee. Brigham starts getting excited and, and I start noticing Brigham's eyes getting a little bit bigger. But the more excited I start seeing Brigham getting, the more I'm starting to perk up and be like, okay, there must be something to this. All of a sudden Brigham says, Ty, that's, gonna, that's a deer you wanna shoot. That's gonna be, that's a nice one. You wanna shoot that one. I was shooting a 300 wind mag and that deer ran 50 yards and took a tumble across the creek and it was over. Up and down, dude, that is a nice buck. Dude, they fed right through where we thought they would. Just, just sit and wait. They just, yeah, doe started filing through and then it's almost like the buck materialized out of nowhere. It's like, oh, there he is. 
The old timer? Or no, the buck knife. Buck knife, buck 110, man. Want to hear a funny story about this knife? I bought two of them, one for Brock and one for Brigham. I liked it so much I kept it and I never bought that one. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that. I did. That's why Brock has one? Uh huh. And not me? Yeah. I was going to buy you another one, I just never have. Let's see how it is. And that was just kind of like the cherry on the top of the trip was being able to, to shoot a nice deer and, and be able to get the meat. You're never upset when your friend is able to shoot and harvest a nice animal, uh, at least not for me. I'm, I'm always excited when one of my buddies gets to, gets to pull the trigger and put something, something like that down. That's just how it goes sometimes. Most of the time when you get a deer, it's when you're least expecting it and the times when you're expecting it to happen, it falls through. And that was just a prime example of how it goes. We had a, a tremendous summer. We had a great summer. We got a lot done. We got a lot of things accomplished that we needed to accomplish. And before you know it, you know, late fall is coming on um, and it's, it's time to work. It seems like usually when we work bison, because of the time of year it is, it's not generally what you would call general weather. It's not nice summer weather. It's not <clears throat> nice spring weather. Usually it's cold. Usually it's snowy, uh, a lot of times it's muddy. And this year, it was the complete opposite. It was so dry, so dusty, and it was it was just miserable. When you got back away from the trails, it just liked a great big old dust cloud going on over there, you know, like it was a big whirlwind or something. It was the driest, dustiest year I've ever seen up there. And, and you know, you get a few hundred head like running down an alley like that, and it just fills the air. You know, you can't see, you can't breathe. It blinds you. You can't see five feet in front of you. And if you can't see that far, then that's that's the visibility is five feet. Well, the bison can't see more than five feet either. So so when they come back down an alley or something, you're not seeing them and they're not seeing you until you guys are, are face to face. And then you, you better be quick to, to get on a fence or get out of the way because if something's gonna happen or someone's gonna get put in a in a precarious or dangerous situation, this this is gonna be the time. On this particular ranch, we've got a pretty nice system on how we can how we can catch the entire herd at one time. We catch them in, in a big pen, we move them to another pen that's a little bit smaller, and then we move them to, to another pen that's that's kind of round. And they'll go in there and they'll they'll come in and they'll they'll hit the end of it, they'll turn around and want to go out the way that they came in, and we'll just kind of swing a gate. So they think they're they're running away from us, and next thing you know, we've got them caught in an alley, and we're able to shut gates behind them and just kind of advance them forward as we go. Before you know it, they're in our squeeze chute, and the vet can can get a good look at them uh, in there. He'll he'll check to see if they're pregnant, to see if they're not pregnant. A lot of people will just do it with their arm, like they'll put on a long sleeve that comes all the way up, and like they just put their arm right up the cow's butt. It seems disgusting, and the first couple times you do it, it is. But yeah, like you can just, with your hand, like you can straight up, you can feel a calf inside there. Nowadays, you know, like the vet that comes and does it for us, he uses a ultrasound, which is just kind of a long probe. It's much smaller in diameter than a typical uh, human male arm. So he's able to do that, and it's it's a lot easier on the animals, I, I would think, and um, it's a lot quicker too. So he can just put that right in there. He wears these goggles um, that show the image, and yeah, he puts that probe up there, and like, if she's pregnant, it's usually like almost instant. He can tell like right away. We'll also put a RFID tag. It's a little round tag that you can scan and and get um, all of the information on that animal, so you know. If it was, if it was pregnant, if it was um, vaccinated, an age, I think I was running the shoot or giving shots or something, and um, I heard a bunch of commotion off in one of the pens, and you know people yelling and trying to trying to communicate with each other, and 
So we kind of stopped and, and I went running over there to see what was going on and there was this bison cow and she had her leg up and caught between the gate and the post uh, on the latch side. So there's the hinges on, on this side and the latch is over here and she somehow she had put her body weight into it enough to push the gate away from the post and her leg slipped in there and then when she backed off the, the gate tightened back up over her leg and she couldn't get her leg out. Let me see that crowbar, bro. So if this, does that chain hold, the only thing holding this gate? Yeah, that from, busts, it's gonna come flying, flying open. open probably. So don't break it. We can, it's we got can. more than one chain holding it. Yeah, let's get this one, let's get yeah, this one. Probably break that here. Okay. okay. And so, you know, we're sitting there trying to figure out how we're gonna get get her loose and there's so much pressure on the gate that you know like you can't move the gate you can't unlatch it the chain is just bound tighter than a drum so we had to use a little bit of ingenuity we you know we used a, a crowbar actually to to kind of get some leverage and and get some some pressure taken off the gate so we could get the we could get the gate open finally we got it open and and you know it was at that point we realized that you know her leg had been put in a position where it it was not meant to be and you know between that and and all the stress she uh she she couldn't get up and we lost that cow which which is always rough well we had a mishap so you know how there's a gap between the gate and the gate post uh -huh. well that cow she tried to jump pretty much over the gate well she got her hoof her, her hoofs up there and her left hoof slid between the gate and the gate post and then her hoof like wouldn't let it pull out. And so she was pretty much just like hanging there from that leg and it just mm -hmm. broke that joint. And then also that was putting so much pressure on that chain, we had to pretty much break the chain latch so we could even get the gate open, get her hoof out, but it's broken. So we pulled her out of there like two minutes later, she was, she was dead. So well, she, that's, that's stress. Buy some stress. Yep. Get them in time. So yep. Well, okay. Well, bad news, but uh, keep moving a bit. Every year is is a learning experience for us, and in our our time off, that's when we make these adjustments to to keep our animals and ourselves safe. When we lose an animal, uh, we take care of it. We'll do what we can to to salvage what's available. And then after that, it's it's right back to work. We've got only so many so many days and so much time, where we've got these people, we've got a vet, we've got everything lined up, and it has to be done within this time frame. So we went right back to work as soon as we took care of that animal. And next thing I know, I see I see a truck coming coming up the ranch, and instantly I know I know who it is, and I know and I know what's coming with them. Tyler and Nate showed up late as usual. You know, we're, we're sitting there working and we can see them coming up the road. Of course, Brock's worried because those guys are going to come harass him. For whatever reason, when you get a, a big kid that has a cattle prod in his hand and his buddy's got his back turned towards you, it's hard not to have that want to shock him kind of feeling. And, and uh, but I mean, it's risk and reward. You, you got to be on your toes because if you do something like that, like I said before, most of the time, if not all of the time, it's gonna come right back at you. <laughs> you get shocked by one of those cattle prods, it's, it does, it feels like a pretty good bee sting. I mean, it, it gets you pretty good. If they get you good, if they hit that and push it hard into you, like it'll, it'll make you wanna drop. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty intense, it's pretty funny. It's a hassle for me, cause it's like, rather than guys showing up and helping, it's like, I pretty much just lose a guy. With Brock, like he's you know he's half the man he was because he's constantly looking over his shoulder and worrying about what's coming. I feel like I got the brunt of that because of just the position I was in. I was in a bad spot. I had Nate on my right and Brock on my left, and. Man, that role could have easily been switched if Nate was in the middle. There's no teams. It's it's just whoever gets Wiley. It's unpredictable. Oh, 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 
Everyone's shocking each other and whipping each other, and sometimes I just feel like I'm a lone duck out there trying to do all this work by myself. It's a good thing at least one of us is at least a little bit mature, otherwise we'd never get anything done. Yeah, the first time I got in there running with the dust, um, I was a little bit apprehensive. It, it probably seemed like it, you know, it was my first day doing it. You can't see three feet in front of your face. And you're literally just running blind up these alleys because you got to keep the buffalo going. You got to keep them going because if you don't, they'll stop and they'll turn around and come back the other way. This is sketchy. Oh my gosh. And we're just running. We're like, this isn't good. I would deal with any of the other conditions over the dust any day of the week. The first time Nate and I were running through was probably the first time that I chasing the buffalo that I was really like scared that they were gonna turn because if they do turn, like I said, you wouldn't know that they were coming. Yep. Yep. All right. I think we ended up working all of our animals and they were all our alley, our single file, the sweep tub, everything was empty. There was there was maybe 20 animals left that needed to be brought up. So everyone goes back there and just kind of makes a line and starts pushing them. And this cow is just just that way, just ornery and, and turns around and comes back with the calf. Oh, <laughs> Watch out, Brad! Brad, how was that? A little close. <laughs> <laughs> you reminded me of playing football in high yeah. school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was a good but one. But I missed the tackle. Yeah, you missed the tackle. <laughs> <laughs> they just split right around him, and I thought for sure, I thought for sure Brad was going to get hammered that day, but somehow he somehow he dodged it and, and came out to tell about it, but it was, it was close. It was really close. We were super lucky this time that everything went as smooth as it did, and there were no there were really no injuries. But you get down in there with those animals enough times, eventually something bad's gonna happen.